um, if you're new here, um, thank you for visiting. Please hit the subscribe button to join our community so you don't miss um, any episodes in the future. And um, today's topic, we're talking about uh, trauma, specifically intergenerational trauma. And um, one of the things I recognized over the years as I worked as a psych nurse for 17 years is that trauma is a huge factor in mental health and addictions issues. And many people struggle with this. It's not uncommon. In fact, the number one cause of uh, violence in, in our world today is not war. Um, it's people who experience domestic abuse, whether that's childhood abuse or intimate partner abuse, um, sex trafficking, uh, prostitution, all of these things. Um, and that type of traumatic experience has a huge impact on a person's sense of self and mental health and or even addictions issues. And one of the people, um, a leading expert in this area is um, Vander Kolk, who has written a book called The Body Keeps Score. I'm just going to read a quick um, passage from a recent article that I read. And it says, the impact of adverse childhood experiences is a, a major thread of van der Kolk's work, explains why so many people bear the hallmarks of traumatic stress from depression to addiction. The Body Keeps Score argues that childhood child abuse constitutes the gravest and most costly public health issue in the United States. And I would say that goes for around the world as well. Um, domestic violence is not just um, something that happens in the States. In a landmark in 1998 U.S. study cited in the book, more than a quarter of respondents said they have been physically abused as children. It also found that people who had four types of negative early life experiences, such as abuse, neglect, or family dysfunction, were seven times more likely to become alcoholics than those who had none. Everybody who gets hurt at home tries to pretend it's normal to everybody else, says Vander Kolk gravely of the child's evolutionary impulse to protect the bond with their caregiver, even if that person is causing them harm. You're not going to tell your classmate that something bad has happened to you. So that's, um, I think, a, a common universal experience that people have um, with being having a betrayal trauma. And I'm going to put a link in the description below of a couple of videos that will address that. One of them is uh, The Power of Vulnerability, for example, by Brene Brown, but I'll put other links as well. Um, another person that does great work around trauma is Gabor Mate, and I love his work. Um, he's the gentleman who has written uh, In the Realms of a Hungry Ghost. And so, yeah, this is kind of what we're, this is the lay of the land of what we're talking about today. So where do you want to start? What comes to your mind like when you're hearing? I mean, it's a pretty diverse, you know, it's a diverse topic. And really like the article is saying, a lot of it starts in childhood, right? And there is a greater preponderance now to label almost any adverse condition someone experiences as being traumatic. And, you know, as I think it was Viktor Frankl that said, you know, everyone has their own Auschwitz, which really just means it, it doesn't, it doesn't benefit anyone really to compare suffering. Uh, but the use of particular language and especially that word, you know, trauma, other diagnostic terms, it, sh it contextually shifts the way a person sees themselves. Like that's really the issue that I've, I've kind of seen uh, around languaging. And it's never to mean that someone hasn't gone through something that for them, 
you know, it's not a relative experience. It doesn't matter if someone else went through the, the exact same thing and had a different response. Doesn't matter. It's not a, not a relative experience. It's like, but it is important to not put yourself into a definitive box of someone who is, you know, traumatized in a complex way. It's like, that might be true for you. It's like, but, but shifting yourself into a new context of strength and recovery and forgiveness and acceptance, you know, all these types of principles move someone, you know, farther away from their suffering where getting stuck in the diagnostic terminology, you know, of being, you know, a sufferer of a, of a complex intergenerational trauma, you know, that takes that person's situation and, and it makes it bigger than them where now they view it as something like, Oh my God, this is, you know, this is horrible. You know, it's, it's the worst thing that could have happened to me. And, and they get al almost stuck in that perspective. And if you, <clears throat> you know, in your experience, you know, working in clinics and working with patients in your dialogue with them, uh, have you had like similar experiences like that where someone is just almost, almost stuck in a traumatic cycle of, you know, bringing up whatever the event is and reliving it. And then that kind of doubles down on the fact that they can't move past it and they just go, you know, round and round and round. Yeah, I think it's a, a good starting point, actually, because nowadays trauma, just like other diagnoses, PTSD, depression, anxiety is just thrown out at all times for even minor inconveniences and things sometimes. And that doesn't really constitute, like you said, there's kind of levels and degrees of what people go through that is considered traumatic, even though yes, whatever the individual says is traumatic for them is also traumatic for them because everybody has a different temperament. Um, there's a couple of things with trauma. One is society does not want to acknowledge trauma. It's shameful. It's embarrassing. Nobody wants to talk about it. And that is, I think, one of the reasons why people get stuck in that identity is because nobody either acknowledges the trauma or wants to address it. Most of the time, many people are misdiagnosed as having mental illness when their really core underlying issue is trauma. So people do get stuck in that place of identifying with their trauma and feeling victimized and not being able to move forward, not being able to forgive. But the other counterpart to that is the lack of acknowledgement and of how much suffering that causes and how much problem that causes in a person's life. And perhaps a lot of the times, whoever the abuser is, um, whether, you know, that's usually family members, they're not willing to acknowledge or work to repair the relationship. And so that wound doesn't have any closure and people want closure and people want acknowledgement, people want an apology. And that is usually not something that comes. And so, and I, I have experienced this in my own life. It's, and I've seen it in many people's lives. So it's hard to move away from that identity when there is something that is unresolved. So it's not that I think people want to remain a victim for years and decades and um, otherwise. It's just that, and even in the system, in the conventional system, trauma wasn't even recognized until the 1980s when the Vietnam veterans came back. And so the work is very young. It's not young in terms of human experience of like trauma being a part of our history and intergenerational trauma being there, but we're not finding, like we don't actually really truly know the impact and the effect in terms of how to move forward. And also like you are talking about, what are the strengths and resiliency that can come up if you're were able to work through trauma? And many people are not supported to do so, either by family or mental health professionals. Yeah, and I would never suggest that someone really wants to play the victim and stay stuck in, in any kind of traumatic cycle. Mm -hmm. It's like, really, I know from my own experience, you know, more subjectively, it's that you lack 
the, the experience or the education or the perspective to break that cycle for yourself. And really, you know, from, from sorting out some of my own, I don't know, I, I don't even like to use the word traumatic as far as my circumstances. It's like, but I've had my own experiences with mental health and family dynamics. You know, like I'm a child of divorce. You know, my, my father, he's recovered now, but he was an alcoholic. Like there's things in my background that are definitely challenging. And, it, and from my perspective, it was more that until you can find a way to understand and organize the information inside of those events like that that's key your mind will just keep replaying it over and over and over and over again it just it hasn't found an appropriate way to kind of categorize that information and put it back in the archives so you don't have to think about it anymore and that's especially true you know with childhood trauma because a lot of those memories and the way you experience them even if you're an adult now is almost still through you know, the filter of how a child experiences it, you know, it can't, you know, if something happened to you when you're five, you almost need another person to be the adult so that like your five-year-old can be in the room and the adult can guide you through the experience. It's like, and really help you to understand and organize it. And that doesn't mean it, it immediately makes it better and it doesn't undo anything that's happened, you know, to you or to another person. It's like, but again, the goal needs to be incremental improvement, you know, incremental movement out of that traumatic experience and reliving it over and over and over again inside your own mind and creeping more towards a state of recovery, just away from suffering. And I think that's something that gets overlooked too, is that people come in for whatever kind of treatment and they just want it to be done. They want it over, you know take this medication or three sessions with this therapist. I'm not going to be here, you know, for an extended period of time. I need this done, sorted, settled. And from my experience, that just isn't the case. You know, it's, it's not that you have to spend three years in the same state. And then at the end of three years, experience some relief. It's, you know, it's, it's bit by bit and brick by brick you move towards a recovery where, you know, there's an increase in, in positive experience as you go. It's like, these things typically are, you know, complicated and come with a lot of questions attached to them. And it takes time to, you know, to sort them out. And usually, you know, the help of someone, whether a professional or an informal type of support, uh, but it's very, very difficult to do on your own. Absolutely. Um, I know that that was also, I've I witnessed that in many of my clients and as the same for me. Um, and I've discussed in other videos on this channel in terms of my background and with trauma, there's lots of intergenerational trauma, significant history, uh, physical abuse. And I, I it would have taken, it, would have taken both formal and informal supports for me throughout my life, actually. And I think both are absolutely critical, as well as education and awareness. Um, I didn't even think I had the term or understood what it meant and what had happened until I went to school and started like taking psychology classes and started reading books how it affected me. And even then, once people recognize that this has happened and it has impacted them, it's a lifelong journey in terms of repairing and healing from that and having to live with the effects of trauma, whether that is on your self-esteem, the way you view the world. Um, I think there's huge issues with intimate connections and relationships in general when you come from that place of having broken trust. Um, there is a huge portion of study that have been done um, in the past that say that if you have had adverse childhood experiences, the more of them that you have, many different kinds, whether that's divorce or physical abuse or uh, poverty or moving a lot or whatever it is, that the higher risk that you are for physical and mental health and addictions issues. Um, there is like a cost to it as well trillions of dollars um, 
for people in terms of the economy and people having mental health issues and what it actually costs to have that domestic violence and violence in the world. Um, so it's a, a huge undertaking, but yeah, no, it's not a an overnight thing that happens in terms of healing. And it requires an incredible amount of effort on both sides. I think a lot of the times what I find is people struggle, like I said, to do the work on their own or um, they want the cooperation of their family to do the work and not everybody is on the same page. So relationships are always strained and people want connection with their family, but there are times when people are not able to move forward with that just because those not everybody is committed to the same level of self-improvement or working on trauma as other people are. Um, so that makes it more challenging. But it's not to say that people can't do the work on their own either. You don't need, you know, sometimes people have passed on. So that person is not there to work out and repair the relationship with you or to move forward. So that is something that you need other people's support, whether formal or informal, to work through. Mm 